Here it is. I'm going to show you in the Hebrew this word. Just so you don't think I made it up. There it is. In Hebrew, you read from the right to the left. That right there is a T. That's an O. L E D O T H. Even though they look alike, if, it's, if that if Tath is on the front of a word, it's a T. If it's on the end of the word, it's a T. Okay? Call it off. Okay? Where do you find that, you say? Well, all over the book of Genesis. Moses, when he wrote the book of Genesis, he wrote it in two manuscripts. Verses 1, 1 through 2, 3 is creation. That's a separate manuscript. Then he started in 2, 4 and went to the end of the book of Genesis and wrote 11 of these. You know, the Bible was written in chapters and verses. And so he wrote it in 11 Toledos. The first one is 2, 4 through the fourth chapter, to the end of the fourth chapter. The second chapter, verse 4, to the end of the fourth chapter is the first one. What's interesting in the English is how they translated that. In the, in the first Toledoth, they translated that in the New American Standard correctly when they translated the account. Account. And it establishes with the first Toledoth what is really a, what they're going to do. Every other time this is used in the book of Genesis, it's going to be translated generations. Generations. So what he's talking about, I know I did, I just, je, last word is generations. What he's talking about is he opens up the Toledoth with the account of the generations of the messianic seed. Watch this now of Genesis 3.15. Genesis 3.15 talks about the seed of the woman, which is the Messiah, who the devil is going to be hunt down and be after the entire period of human history. And so the first Toledoth is described in the English correctly, now, some Bibles, um, Suzanne, Susan, the, the, uh, the, um, you're, I think the King James covers generation right from the start. They, I think they cover generations all the way through. It seems like I ask you that about 2-4. Genesis 2-4. I think I asked you once before. But in the, in the, in the, in the, and generations is a good translation of that. Yeah. But... Every time you find it, so, so you're going to find that here, and you're going to find it in um, the, the ninth chapter. And you're going to find it, and when you find that, you'll find that it's broken. Down. I gave you this, but you're, you're going to find that it's 11 of these. And they're going to give the account of the generations of the Messiah. Now, if you want to see what that really means out of the book of uh, out of the book of uh, Genesis. Write this down. None of this on your paper. Uh, Luke 3, 23 through 38. Because it is in that, it is in that book that he shows you all the generations from Adam to Jesus Christ. That's the genealogy of Jesus Christ. It starts in verse 38 at the bottom. It starts with Adam and then you move all the way up to verse 23, and it's Jesus Christ. Right? Yeah. So what, what Moses did is he broke the, after, after the story of Genesis 3.15, he broke down the generations uh, in the book of Genesis. He wrote down the first 11 generations of the Messiah. 
it's bad enough to hear it the first time rather than have to hear it a second time, right? So remember, our first one is in the English is going to be called the accounts of the generations, and it moves on down. And so the first one is remember is Genesis 2, 4 through the fourth chapter 26. I doubt if I'll get to another one this year. <laughs> um, it's taken me a pretty good last time. Now, the last time we were we were in uh, Genesis 4, 7, so let's go there. 4, 7. And uh, this is uh, the fourth chapter is uh, really about Cain. You remember out of 26 verses, he's mentioned 16 times. That's a lot of times. He's going to be mentioned four times in the Bible, 16 times in the book of Genesis. I gave you that information last week. That would be well worth your time to, to keep up with that. But in verse 7, uh, what, what, he has, what, he, what, what he has done, let me show you. Um, look at verse 3. Look at verse 3, and then we'll go to verse 7. So it came about in the course of time. That was a special Hebraic phrase, meaning a special occasion in the life of these two boys. What we know from biblical history of studying the 11 Toledos is that there were two times in the life of a Messianic person, a person that was in the lineage of Christ. Cain and Abel were in that lineage um, through Adam, but only through Adam, their father. In other words, they were ancestry. They were in line. All right? But it came, and so the first, the first of two rites of passages of rites they had to go through, the first one was a career. And they both have a career. And that's what, the, that it came about in the course of time as a break, saying there, this is a specific, special occasion in the life of these two guys. When you read on, you find in verse 4, you find that the special occasion required a sin offering. Look at verse 4. Abel, on his part, brought of the firstlings of his flock and their fat portion. That makes that sin offering. The Lord had regard for Abel and for his offering, but for Cain and for his offering, he had no regard. Right? So Cain became very angry. Back to verse 3. Back to verse 3. At the end of verse 3, when the, when the boys were instructed what to bring for a sin offering, Cain brought an offering to the Lord of the fruit of the ground because he was a tiller of the ground and his brother was a rancher. He was a herdsman. The other was a farmer. So Cain thought he would bring to God, even though he was told to bring a, a blood offering, he decided he'd bring the best from his crops. But God wanted a sin offering. And so Abel, Abel did what God told him to do. He brought a blood offering. It's called, he brought of the firstlings of the flock and their fat portion. The Lord had regard for Abel and for his offering, but for Cain and for his offering, verse 5, he had no regard. So Cain became very angry and his countenance fell. Remember, we talked about body language. This is how we would say that today. How do you know a person's countenance fallen or risen? Body language. If you stand by, you can see it. Then the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why is your countenance fallen? It, now, here's my passage. If you do well, will not your countenance be lifted up? Because you're in the favor of God. If you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door and its desire is for you, and you must master it. You must master it. There's, and listen, what we're going to learn here Neither one of these two guys can master sin apart from a sin offering. 
There's no way to master sin apart from a sin offering. None. There's no way for you to do it either apart from the gospel of Jesus Christ. No way. There is no way. Because the penalty of Adam's sin has to be paid and the power of sin has to be revealed to you. How do you master sin? There's two parts to it. There's a penalty for it, and there's a power connected to it. So, you got to bring the right offering. That offering, the blood offering, represented what we call the gospel of Jesus Christ. That the Lamb of God, which came to take away the sin of the world, is going to die on a cross. He's going to be buried and raised from the dead, and Paul calls that the gospel. In the Old Testament, it was shadow Christology through animal blood as, he, as symbolic of what Christ would do when he came. That's called prophetic gospel. Old Testament, people are saved by a prophetic gospel. We are saved by a historical gospel. The Messiah has come. He died on a cross. He was buried on third day, raised from the dead. And so... <clears throat> You'll never master sin unless you deal with the penalty and the power. You have to deal with the penalty and the power. Right. So let's have prayer and we'll study this. I gave him a moment of silence. Every head bowed and every eye closed to offer you privacy. If you believe that Jesus died for your sins personally, was buried and raised from the dead, do you believe that? You're saved. Because you live in the new covenant, not the old covenant, the moment you're saved, you're indwelt by the Holy Spirit. As a result, you can either be carnal or spiritual. If your carnal personal sin is evident in your life, what do I do with it to get back to be spiritual? The ministry of the Holy Spirit, I confess my sin. First John 1 John 1.9, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from, cleanse us, cleanse us, from all unrighteousness. So I give you a moment to do that as a believer priest. So Father, we thank you today for these that have come our way to study with us. What, what does this mean? This sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is for you and you must learn to master it. You must master it. Well, it would have become sensible had they both made the same offering. They'd have had the same results. But one offered what God requested, a blood offering, and the other didn't. As good as it seemed to be, the best of from the field, it wasn't what God requested. And so it didn't go well. It did not go well for Cain because he chose not to do the directive will of God, that will that had been revealed by God very clearly about the offering. I pray today, Father, that we would not lose sight of the clarity of the directive will of God for our life. In Jesus' name, amen. So, let's take a look at this. At the top of your paper, if you do well, meaning the will of God, will not your countenance be lifted up? You'll be glad, not mad. If you do not do well, notice the first, watch this now, because you're missing this. The first was a question. And the second is a statement. He asked a question and gave the answer. He said, if you do well, that is, obey the will of God, will not your countenance be lifted up? Because you've done the right thing. You've done well. If you do not do well, that is, go against the will of God, as stated, revealed to you, the directive will, sin is crouching at the door, and its desire is for you, but you must master it. Abel did, Cain didn't. It was a sin offering. He didn't bring a sin offering. All right. 
Now watch this. Point number one. I'm going to give you five ideas here. Point number one. In, in Genesis 1, 1 through 15, we introduced the first two members of the human race who had been born physically alive and spiritually dead in Adam. Adam sinned by eating the, from the forbidden tree. Don't eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. In the day you eat, dying spiritually, you will die physically. That's, that's what that teaches. That's Genesis 2.17. Therefore, every person that is, every human being that born out of the Adamic race, the human race, is born physically alive and spiritually dead. Paul teaches that in 1 Corinthians 15, 22. In Adam, all die. In Christ, all are made alive. Paul comes back in the book of Romans in the fifth chapter, verses 12 through 21, he goes into a long theological discussion on that. He begins his discussion with, therefore, by one man, Adam, sin entered into the world, and death by sin, that's a sin-death problem, uh, passed on to all mankind. That's you and I. We have a sin-death problem in Adam. You understand that? We're all born in Adam. When we're born in Adam physically as a human being, we're spiritually dead, separated from God in time. If you physically die separated from God, you will be separate from, separated from God in eternity. It's called the second death, the second, the second spiritual death, separated from God for all eternity. It's a serious question in your life. It's a serious question. So, so, for in Adam all die, in Christ all are made alive. Where does this whole idea of Christ come from? It comes from Genesis 3.15. The seed of the woman is Christ. How do I know it? Listen to me now. Write this down. Luke 1, 31 through 35, that's how I know it. The woman that we're looking for throughout all history whether it's Sarah or any of the other ladies that, that qualify, it becomes Mary, right? Becomes Mary. Mary, the mother of Jesus. Now, when, 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 you, when you get to the book of Revelation and, and get in a study like we're in on the tribulation on Tuesdays at lunch, and you get into the seventh trumpet as we are this Tuesday, you will see this play out in history. You will see this idea played out in history in the tribulation. In the warfare between God and Satan. Well, for those who come, you'll get, that's what you're going to learn this next week. Listen, he says, if you do well, things will go well, right? If you don't do well, things aren't going to go well. Do you, listen to me. Do you understand that principle? Watch this now. Watch this now, because you're missing this. What's going to make it not go well? You know what this one says? Sin crouched at the door. Sin. And if you open that door, sin is going to pounce on you like a roaring lion. That's, that's Satan's pet who's come to devour your life. To devour your life. 1 Peter 5.8, write that down. 1 Peter 5.8. Listen, sin, bring a sin offering he did bring a sin offering. So there's the sin that's crouching at his door. It is this, the sin of unbelief, right? There, there's, there's probably no greater sin in your life than the sin of unbelief. That was true for him. Now let me tell you another thing. See, if he'd have just done the will of God, and listen, after he brought the wrong thing, God gave him a chance. He said, look, bring me the right offering and everything will go well. 
He still refused to do it. God is, is long-suffering and patient towards us that none would perish, but that all would be saved. You've got to understand that. Point number two. Remember the special Hebrew phrase found in Genesis 4, 3 through 5, 3 through 5, so it came about in the course of time. These guys are going to bring a sin offering. They are instructed by God to bring a firstling of the flock, that would be an animal blood sins offering, and the fat portions, the, the burnt part of it. And the Lord had regard for Abel's offering, but for Cain and for his offering, he had no regard. Listen, the, the only way to God is through Jesus Christ. And for Cain and Abel, it was the sin offering that said that Christ has come to die for your sins, be buried and raised from the dead. You believe it, you're going to be saved. Just like he says today, it's not different. This is God's will that you be saved, be rescued from the domain of darkness and from the, the, the judgment of Adam's sin that's upon you through your birth as a human being. I don't. This Hebrew phrase is dealing with the second rite of passage. The first rite of passage was their career, and the second is grace salvation. The great salvation, the rite of the blood uh, sin offering, was provided to Adam and Eve after they ate from the forbidden tree. This is not the first occasion. This family has had their, Adam and Eve had to do this when they sinned, when they ate from the tree. They had to do that. This is, this is found in Genesis 3.15 along with 21 through 24. It's all about the Messiah. It's all about Christ. It's all about Christ. It's all about the seed of the woman or Christ. Now watch. When Adam and Eve were in the garden and they ate of the tree of knowledge, before they ate of the tree of knowledge, there was a tree in the middle of the garden called the tree of life and they could eat from it. It had to do with something related to their perfect existence with, a, with an eternal life connection. Do you understand that? When they ate of the tree, the forbidden tree, they were no longer, they no longer had access to the tree of life in the middle of the garden. They were forbidden to eat from it. In fact, they were expelled from the garden and a flaming sword was put at the entrance so nobody could enter it. Because nobody, listen, nobody gets to the tree of life except through Christ. There is no eternal life apart from Christ. You can be moral, you can be religious. You can be a good person. But without faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ, you don't have access to God. Access to God is everything. Jesus said in the 14th chapter, verse, verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That's a pretty strong statement, isn't it? In fact, you hear religions just say, that's pretty narrow-minded. I don't know. It depends if you understand what it costs God. Narrow-minded. He gave up his only begotten son, hung him on a cross to die the most cruel, terrible death for sin. He took our hell, our judgment. I don't think that's an easy way in. Not in my mind. They're not able to get to the tree of life. They were able before, but they're not able now because sin. Sin. Because sin. They went against the will of God. Sin. 
Do you know what sin is in your life? I mean, could you identify it? Could you identify sin in your life? How would you do that? Because you've learned from the Bible what sin is, right? You've read Romans, the third chapter, or you should. The law exposes you to what sin is. Once you understand what sin is, you have to realize, what do I have to do to correct it? What do I have? If I sin, what do I have to do? I have to confess it. What do I have to do to correct the pattern? Did you ever think about that? Why do you let sin crouch at your door? You open it up, he pounces on you, and he chews on you for a while, then you shoo him off through 1 John 1, 9, but you don't correct your problem. So guess what? He shows up at your door tomorrow. <laughs> right? Is he gonna is he gonna crouch at your door? Yes. He's gonna keep crouching at your door until your door is not open to sin. Would you do you understand that? Okay. And listen, if you take care of it God's way, it'll go well with you. And if you don't, it will not go well with you. Agreed? Please get that in your head. Please get that in your head. Point number three, Cain and Abel showed how grace salvation works in the Old Testament. Volitional. You either believe or you don't believe. That's how simple it was. It's how simple it is today. You hear the gospel, do you believe it? Then you get saved. If you don't believe it, then you're not saved. You're not going to be saved until you do believe it. See how simple this is? People are like, well, you make it... Uh, Salvation is the simplest thing in the whole wide world, and you make it so complicated. Do you believe that Christ came into this world, was a historical person, died on a cross for, you, for your sins so that you could go to heaven and be there forever? And all, did you believe that? Yes, I believe that. Well, then, you're in. Are you going to bring a sin offering so that you can get out of Adam and into Christ? Are you going to bring that Abel? Are you going to bring that Cain? Well, if you bring it, if you bring it by faith, this is a done deal, right? And if you don't, it's not. It was very clear. God explained, we call that the directive will, God explained that the sin offering he wanted for salvation was animal blood of shadow Christology, Hebrews 8, 9, and 10. You should read that, and you will understand this passage. You know, I tell you to do that, and you don't do it. I can't make you. you he, listen, they were told to bring the firstlings of the flock as well as the fat portions. Agreed? It's not complicated. We call what God explained to these guys about, about this issue was the directive will. The directive will points towards positive volition of faith. The directive will is always interested when the directive will is revealed to you it is revealed to you because you still have positive volition and God wants faith from it. He wants your positive volition to attach to the word of God, the will of God, and put your faith in it. Write this down. Romans 10, 17. Where does faith come from? Hearing the word of God. Faith comes from hearing the word of God. Faith comes from hearing the Word of God, and by hearing the Word of God, you're going to exercise it. Volitionally, you're going to exercise believing. Once you believe what God has told you to do, once you believe it, you have faith. Your faith has been exercised. See, believing is exercise. The word believe is pastuo. It's a verb. And the word faith is pistas. It's a noun. When you believe what God has told you to do and you do it, you have faith now. Your believing has become faith. Well, oh, you've got to understand this stuff, people. I put... I spoil you people. I put Romans 10, 17 on the, on the page for you, right? 
right? Listen to Romans 1.16. It's on probably the next page. I am not ashamed of the gospel. Let, let me tell you. See, that's an interesting word to me, ashamed. I hear that all the time, and I go, what in the world could that possibly mean? And I know what shame is. And I know ah means without it. What would that look like? What would that look like? For example, for me, it would it would it would be the it would it would look at John fourteen six. Where a person said, "Well, I, 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 I think I'm a religious person. I, 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 I'm a good Jew. I'm a good Muslim. I'm a good this. I'm a good that. I go to, I, I go to, I go to the places of worship. Uh, yeah. But you know, you're, and he, for me, here's what would be ashamed." To, to not give them the absolute truth that can release them from Adam's sin. Because religion won't do it. They will die and go to hell. They will die and go to hell. No matter what their religion is. I don't care what they worship. It's idolatrous. If it's not Christ, it's idolatrous. You just have to understand this stuff. And for me... I am not ashamed of the gospel. I have to be bold to tell that person. Now, what they do with that information is their business. I'm not there to twist their arm. I'm there to inform them of something. So the Holy Spirit has something to work with in their life in what's called conviction of John 16, 7 through 11. My responsibility, and listen, for me, I would be ashamed to stand in the presence of somebody that thought they were going to go because they were bringing fruit when God wanted blood. Right? So, I don't mean, probably means different things to different people, but that's what it means to me. I am not ashamed of the gospel, for the gospel is the power of God to salvation to everyone who believes the Jew first and then the Gentile or the Greek. The gospel according to Paul of 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4 is of first importance. I wrote 1, 2, and 3 because he said this is very important and he used the word that to be markers. He used three of them as markers. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. And there's no way around that, my dear friend. There is no way around that. Point number four, Abel, back to our story, Abel will show that Old Testament unbelievers, like the New Testament unbelievers, must be saved by grace through faith as a gift and not works. You got to do it God's way. You can't do it your way. Right? God said, I want the first lane of the flock and I want the fat portions of it. I want the sin offering. This will be a done deal. You bring it by faith, and you're saved. We today talk this way out of Ephesians 2, 8, 9. Here's how we explain it under the new covenant. For by grace you have been saved through faith, like Abel, and that not of yourself it is a gift of God, as decreed, not as a result of works like Cain's, so that no man can boast like Cain. No man could boast. He got mad because God didn't accept his because it wasn't a blood offering. You have a wonderful gift, Cain, but it's not what I, it's not what I said you had to have. So go get me what I requested and everything will be okay. And Cain, Cain wouldn't do it. Maybe like, maybe like you, you're not going to, you're not going to believe that Jesus died for your sins was buried. 
or maybe you are a believer and you're not going to deal with the sin that's at your door every night. The sin that's at your door every night. You're not going to deal with it. Well, anyhow, watch this now. Watch that. This is really important because the writer of Hebrews 11 chapter give us a great word about Abel's offering of salvation. By faith, Abel offered a better sacrifice than Cain based on Romans 10, 17, because this is what the Lord requested of him. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. Where did he get the idea that he was supposed to bring that offering? And where did, get Cain, where did Cain get the idea he should bring a different offering what God told him, right? So by faith, Abel offered a better sacrifice according to, because it was according to the will of God through which he obtained, through which, what, what, what's, where's the which go? Not, not which, now which. Watch this now. You miss this stuff. By faith offered a better sacrifice, through which? The, the, the faith that offered the better sacrifice, which was according to God's will, through which he obtained the testimony that he was righteous. His gift said, I believe that Jesus is going to die for my sins, be buried and raised from the dead. I bring this in honor of that by, by faith. I believe this by faith. And he became righteous as a gift from God. He became righteous as a gift from God's salvation. He became righteous. Cain didn't. He, he, he brought an unrighteous offering as an unrighteous man, and he reign, remained unrighteous. You're not going to get that changed any other way than a grace gospel. There's no other way to get it done. No other way to get it done, dear heart. Five, the new covenant believer, such as you and I, we live in the church age, the new covenant believer operates from a different spiritual system in the Christian life than the old covenant believers did regarding personal sin. In the old covenant, every believer wasn't indwelt permanently by the indwelling Holy Spirit like the new covenant believers are. We are covered by 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. Don't you know that your body became the temple of God when the Holy Spirit took, took residence in it at the point of salvation? Or John 14, 16, once he takes residence, he can never leave. In the Old Covenant, certain believers were give, given the Holy Spirit for specific tasks and then removed when the task was done, or it could be removed by a sovereign decision of God. They were not indwelt. Not every believer had the Holy Spirit. Only certain ones. You can examine two kings and see this principle very clear. The first king of Israel, King Saul, is identified in 1 Samuel 15, 1 through 3. He is the king, and because he is the king of the priest nation of Israel, he has the Holy Spirit residing with him or by him for him. God removed both the kingship and the Holy Spirit from Saul, who was a believer. You can read about this in 1 Samuel 15, 10 through 16, all the way through the all the way through 35. It, you're probably familiar with it, maybe not in that context. Secondly, there's a, a second king, probably the greatest king of the, of the priest nation of Israel was a guy called David, King David. In 1 Samuel 16, 1 through 3, he too has an anointing for kingship of the Holy Spirit who's going to reside with him in his kingship. David gets involved with Bathsheba, right? In 2 Samuel 11 and 12, and now becomes worried that God will remove the Holy Spirit from his life like he did Saul. 
And so he get, begins to beseech the Lord. And you can read about this in 1 Samuel 16, 11 through 14. And in Psalms 51, 4, as well as verses 11 through 12 and 17. It's well worth your read to see how it operated in the Old Testament. You understand that? Well, you will when you read this stuff. I only have an hour to give you this stuff. Can't do all of that. You've got to read some of this. Now, let me make a final point to you. Let me make a final point to you. Down here, after, after first, second, this could be a point six if you wanted it. And here could be a point six for you. I'm going to put it on my paper because you'll ask me someday. You know that point six? So I'm going to make it a point six. Watch this now because I need to talk to you a moment. As a new, a new covenant believer in the church age, the permanent indwelling of the Holy Spirit, who is the third member of the Godhead, who dwells inside your body at the point of salvation. Do you understand that? Well, you've got to read 1 Corinthians 6, 19, and 20 to get that. You've got to read passages like John 7, 38, uh, 37 through 39. The Holy Spirit will become an artesian well with inside you to the abundant life in Christ. You got to read this stuff. I know. John 7, 37 through 39. The permanent indwelling of the third member of the Godhead is the sovereign power. When I say power, I'm talking about the third member of the Godhead. I'm talking about God, the Holy Spirit, is the sovereign power, a sovereign power in your life. You people say to me, oh, Ron, I've got this addiction and I can't quit. Are you kidding me? You're, you're talking about self-will. You're talking about within your own structure of life. Of course you can't. The flesh can't beat the flesh. Only the Holy Spirit can do it. You've got to understand this stuff. The flesh can't beat the flesh. It has no desire to because there's pleasure for a second in the lust of the flesh. Flesh can't beat flesh. It feeds it. Only power over the flesh is the Holy Spirit of God. It is the sovereign power inside your body. And you've got to believe it. I was talking to a young kid today at, at, at Cracker Barrel. I, I've gotten to know him. As soon as I came in, he looked around if there was any, uh, uh, could find any reason for, to meet with me. And so he came in, he said, about a month ago, I started smoking. I went, oh, yeah. I said, well, why are you telling me? He said, because, Ron, within a month, I got addicted to tobacco. And I discovered, now watch this. This is a um, probably 16-year-old kid. And I discovered that the reason I got it is because there's something within the smoking that would cause me to kind of ease down being anxious. I could, I could smoke a cigarette and I kind of, I could, it would kind of mellow me out. And he said, within a month, I was addicted to that um, little bit of peace I get with anxiety. I said, well, you know what that is? He said, yeah, I've discovered it's nicotine. <laughs> He's 16 years old. I said, you know what? That's a wonderful thing. So we, I have talked to him about the gospel before, and he's a believer. I said, how'd you, do, how'd you beat it? He said, well, I first researched it, and I got to thinking, how, did th how was this possible? He said, I could, I could really get addicted to this. And he said, I know that it's bad for my health. And I know I shouldn't be addicted to something like that. I said, well, how did you walk out of it? 
He said, I, I, he said it was tough the first day. I said, well, I'm going to do this. And I put, I put it down. Then I picked it up. <laughs> I put it down, I picked it up, I put it down, I picked it up. I said, he said, I said to the Lord, Lord, I don't know, but I got to have some help. <laughs> I got to have some help with this. And so I was able to explain to him today the ministry of the Holy Spirit of God. I said, son, do you not realize that you have the Holy Spirit? I got the what? Well, when you got saved, you got the Holy Spirit. Whoa. And when you were making your plea to God, God understood that. And God was responding to, 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 to get, get you out of that. But you're talking to God, and God's talking to the Holy Spirit. You know, you need to make that. You can talk to the Holy Spirit about this stuff. And he went, well, I didn't know that. I'm what I know. I know. We well, you know it now. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring him some material for him to study. See, there's a, he, he's never been taught that there was a sovereign power inside him to conquer this stuff. Listen, you've got to learn that. How are you going to share? How are you going to share that your faith to somebody else? Listen, to somebody else that needs to come out of an addictive behavior when you haven't won't conquer it. You know why you don't do it when you're with somebody like that? Because you're ashamed. I am not ashamed. Say, ought to be you. And you ought to be able to have the testimony like this young guy who discovered it. Now it's just to keep him in the trenches, right? To keep him going and, and understanding how all that process is working so he's not grabbing at straws. I'm telling you that there's a sovereign power. The only power over your flesh is the Holy Spirit of God. The, you get angry, you get mad, you get jealous, you get this, you get that. There's only one power over it, only one power over your flesh, and that is the Holy Spirit of God. Write this down, Galatians 5, 16, 17. That's, that's it. If I walk in the Spirit, I will not fulfill it. I, I, that, listen, one's, one's a doctrinal principle and one's a promise. Here's the doctrinal principle. It's a command, by the way. It's a present active imperative, second person plural. Very pateo. Walk. Walk by means of the Holy Spirit, the promise. You will not. You know, you know what that knot is? Listen to me. That knot in that second part of that is ukme. It's a double knot. It's ukme. When Paul writes a double negative and attaches it to something, it means never. This is absolute. It's an absolute. That thing is not not. It should be translated never. If you walk by means of the Holy Spirit, you will never, you will never, it's an absolute promise, you will never fulfill the desires of the flesh, but you got to walk in the Spirit. The power has to come from the Spirit, not human will, not human sources. It's got to come from the Holy Spirit of God. It should come from no other place because you've got the third member of the Godhead with the sovereign power over your flesh. You can beat anything. And so I wrote this on your paper. I wrote this on your paper. You should read, you should also, when you read Galatians 5, 16 and 17, listen to me now, you should circle this one, circle this one on your paper. James 1, 14 and 15. Be sure to study them together. Be sure to study those together. Okay? And then let me close with this, and then we'll take an offering. Listen to Paul. Therefore, do not let sin reign. That's master. Do not let sin reign in your mortal bodies. You know why? Because you have the Holy Spirit there. Do not let sin reign in your mortal so that you obey its lust. Listen to four, verse 14. For sin shall not be master over you. For you, for you, uh, over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. Isn't that wonderful? Well, people.